test of our spirituality is whether we can really pray. Prayer is the breath, the very life breath of faith. So let's go to the Lord now in prayer and pour our hearts out to Him. Our Heavenly Father, we come to You thankful that we can know that we have a mediator between us and You, that we do not come to You in our own person, that we know that if we tried, we would be rejected. The prayers and the sacrifice of the wicked are an abomination unto the Lord, and we're wicked. So how on earth can we ever expect to be heard in our prayers to you? We expect it because we have a mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And we are so thankful that He is the man, Christ Jesus, and thus was able to die. And He was a righteous lamb, and thus His sacrifice was perfect. But He was also fully divine, so that it can have efficacy for all who put their faith in Him. We praise You for these things. We praise you that he didn't stay dead, that you raised him from the dead to show and to say for all time that his sacrifice was indeed effective, that it's a sure bet or sure thing, I should say, to trust in him, that it's, it's safe, that there is a strong tower, that if we run into it, we'll be safe, the strong tower of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're thank thankful, Lord, that He didn't just rise from the dead, but He ever lives now at Your, the Father's right hand, to ever live to intercede for us. Ever live to intercede for us. Lord, we're so grateful for these things. We recognize that we don't appreciate them nearly as much as we should. We come to You today sinful. We come to You today wretched, and, and we sense our evil natures and how they tend to go astray, and we come um, kind of in fear that we will step out and transgress. And Lord, we come to You now grateful for the shedding of the Spirit, for when Christ was raised and ascended on high, He shed His Spirit because He would not leave us comfortless. He would not leave us orphans, but He gave us the Holy Spirit. So Lord, I ask that You would fill us with Your Spirit. Quicken our hunger for You. Open our eyes that we might perceive You and see the wondrous things that are found in Your Word. Quicken our wills and give us desire and resolve, setting our face like flint, joyfully though, to serve You and to obey Your commandments, as not the commands of a judge who will blast our souls, but our Father who knows our good and knows what's best for us. We pray, Lord, that you'd bless each person here spiritually. We all need you so much. One illustration you used was you likened your people to little birdies in the nest, and you say to us, open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. So, Lord, we come here today with our mouths open wide, asking you to fill us because we're needy. Bless each person here, every man, woman, and child, each one of these eternal souls. Lord, meet the needs that are here. Only You can know them all, all the needs, and only You can meet them. So as we dig into Your Word today, minister to us. Walk among the lampstands and minister to the churches. Bless us now as we sing more, as we give, and as we open our Bibles and hopefully our hearts and our ears too to hear your message. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In a few weeks, we're going to be ordaining, Lord willing, of course, uh, Mark Ward as our second elder. And we have some pastor friends who are coming all the way across the country to help with that. Um, one of the reasons why we're doing that is because in the pastoral epistles, we're trying to follow the Word of God and the Apostle Paul's directions to churches. In the pastoral epistles, we're, we're told that Timothy, who was a pastor, um, was installed in that role through what is called the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. The presbytery is from the word presbyteros, which is where we get the word elder. 
And um, a presbytery is a group of them laying hands upon a candidate to be an elder to install him, so to speak, in that role. Now, we only have one elder. When I was uh, installed or ordained, they call it, when I was ordained, um, there were pastors from all over this area that came to First Baptist of Cedar Woolley, and they questioned me, and then the church voted, and they laid hands on me and ordained me to the gospel ministry. Um, we're basically doing the same thing with Mark. And uh, that's, Lord willing, going to be the very end of this month, and we'll be announcing that probably every week as the, as the, uh, the weeks tick by. Um, another passage in the pastoral epistles, Paul counsels Timothy, and he says to Timothy, do not lay hands quickly on any man. We've kind of followed that rule because Mark's been here five years now, and we haven't laid hands on him yet. Uh, we haven't had a presbytery gather and ordained him that way. Um, so we're going to be doing that, Lord willing, at the end of this month. And I want to start preaching about elders, but um, I'm going to start that next week. Today I'd like to preach on the subject of joy in the dark places. Um, I'm hoping there isn't some big hullabaloo in culture before next week because I really want to start uh, teaching on elders. But there is a place for noticing what people are going through and giving direction from the Word of God uh, with regard to those difficult trials that people are going through right now. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about joy, joy in the dark places. Are we going through dark places? Sure, we sure are. The way for believers to have biblical joy is simple. You go to God's Word and you encounter its truth. You believe it accept it as true for you, and then you insist that your emotions agree with it. <laughs> insist. Remember I was talking earlier about a positive form of self-talk. People are good at self-talk. They do it all the time. I'm not saying that everybody mumbles to themselves under their breath, <laughs> although some people do that too. Um, but everybody's talking to themselves a lot. And a lot of times the, the talk that they uh, give to themselves is negative, uh, depressed, disquieted, just as the psalmist says in Psalm 45, verse 2, as we read, why are you cast down, O my soul? He's addressing himself. He's noticing all of the turmoil, the disquiet that's within him. And then he counsels himself. He basically says, you need to trust God. You need to believe in the truth of God. You need to believe that you shall yet praise Him for the help of His countenance. And so the way for a believer to have biblical joy is to go to God's Word, encounter its truth, believe it, and believe that it's true for you. There's a difference between those two things, by the way. You can believe something and feel like it's not true for you. Biblical faith is not just belief that it's true. Biblical faith is belief in it as true for you. And so he basically applies it. He confronts his depressed self. This is how Lloyd-Jones commented on that verse. He said, you have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself and preach to yourself. Are you good at preaching to yourself? You have to remind yourself of God. And then, having done that, defy yourself and say with this man, I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. So good so true. This is exactly what it means to have biblical joy. If you don't defy yourself, your little whiny soul that wants to pout about grumbling circumstances, if you don't defy yourself, that this part of you that wants to get depressed and disquieted and say, hope in God, you, look up and see Him. If you don't do that, you won't have biblical joy. It's a very important sort of self-talk that takes itself in hand and doesn't let the grumbling nature of Adam have the spotlight. So it's more than insisting that your emotions agree with the truth. The psalmist is confronting himself, defying himself, as Lloyd-Jones points out. Defying? That's a strong term. 
It's a very important sort of self-talk that embraces the truth decisively, aggressively, and then banishes all the negativity in the soul that arises. And where does that banish? Where do, you have to banish the negativity in the soul. And the question is, where does all that negativity come from? And it's, it's from displeasure in our circumstances. That's what it's from. We have displeasure in our circumstances, whatever those circumstances may be. And that's why I'm preaching this this morning, because we've all got something to be displeased about. Do we not? Yeah. What a week, right? <laughs> Is it going to keep getting worse? What if it does? See, the negative self-talk arises from our displeasure or our circumstances. That's where it comes from. But you've got to silence the faithless self-talk. You must continue faith's victory by carrying the truth around with you. And you have to keep reasserting it and adding more truth to it. You have to keep relating to Christ in light of it. It's sort of like, it's sort of like a lamp. Have you ever been in a cabin where there was an oil lamp? And it's the only thing that was lighting up the room. And, and then the, the oil starts to run out and it starts to get dim and the darkness starts to encroach. You have to fill the oil up. Exactly. You have to fill the oil up. It's sort of like keeping a wood stove warm to keep the room warm. You have to keep feeding it the wood. It's the same thing with biblical joy. You can't think, oh, I had a great quiet time. Now let's just go on through the rest of the day. You're going to need to keep feeding yourself that biblical joy. Keep putting oil in that lamp all day long or else the darkness will encroach. That's the way it works. It's always trying to encroach. And you'll note that in my illustration here about the oil and the wood stove, the oil lamp and the wood stove, you'll note that the kindling for the soul is the Word of God. Biblical joy is Word-centered. Listen to this verse from Psalm 119. Here's another psalm. I looked at Psalm 42 a minute ago. Now I'm going to look at Psalm 119, verse 14, if you want to look that up real quick. It's a verse that talks about how biblical joy is word-centered. In other words, it's basically saying the same thing that I'm saying, that if you want to use the illustration of the wood stove, the wood that you put in the stove, the stove is you, and you've got to stay warm, and the wood that you keep putting in it is the Word of God. Here's a great uh, verse, Psalm 119, verse 14, that talks about how biblical joy is indeed word-centered. He says, I have rejoiced, there's the warmth, right, the joy. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies, there's the word, as much as in all riches. He's, he is stocking his soul with the testimonies of God, the word of God, and it's causing joy in his life. Such a crucial thing. Are you stocking your soul with the word? Experiencing biblical joy may be simple, but it isn't easy, is it? <laughs> I mean, you can see how to experience it. What have I said so far? You go to the Word. You experience the Word. You encounter the truth. You believe it. You believe it's true for you. And then you confront your negative self-talk and replace it with positive self-talk based on that truth from the Word that you gathered. And then you keep kindling it, keep that fire aflame and don't let it go out. Next thing you know, you've got a life, despite difficulty and bad circumstances, of joy because you're demanding and insisting that your emotions respond to that truth from the Word, not the circumstances. Simple but not easy. It isn't easy to grasp the Bible's teaching. It isn't easy sometimes to see how to respond to it. And it's definitely not easy to confront your wayward emotions. It's really not easy to do that. Sometimes you literally want to wallow rather than rejoice. That's how hard it is. It's hard to overcome tiredness and brain fog. I mean, how many cups of coffee am I going to have to have this morning to be able to think, right? How many times have you felt that way? It's hard to lay aside sin and the, and the weight that so easily uh, takes our joy away. People who want to rejoice in the Lord have to concentrate on Him. They have to fix their gaze on Jesus, Hebrews chapter 12 teaches us. 
And this requires spirit-empowered resolve. You have to have spirit-empowered resolve. What I want to do today is I want to define biblical joy from Scripture the, and see why it's utterly important. I want us to walk away with this attitude. I want us to walk away going, you know what? I am going to rejoice. I don't care. I don't care if there's no fruit on the vine. I don't care if there's no cattle in the stall. I don't care if I wake up in the morning and there's not a red cent in my bank account. I don't care if my house burns down. I am going to rejoice in God, my Savior. That, by the way, is a, a very loose paraphrase of a couple verses from Habakkuk, chapter 3. <laughs> I'm going to rejoice in God, my Savior. The truth of the Word of God conquers negative circumstances. So let's define biblical joy from Scripture. We've got several points on that. Then we're going to see why it's important, why it's utterly crucial that you have biblical joy and that you, you know, the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. That's God saying to do something always. So it's utterly crucial. We need to see why it's crucial. And then... I want to make seven applications at the end. So we're going to have basically three movements to the message. What is biblical joy? Why it's important? And then how to do this. <laughs> Some thoughts about how to, how to do this, how to have it. Okay? So number one, biblical joy. Biblical joy. Number one, it makes you strong to do right in hardship. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So biblical joy is strengthening joy. It helps you endure life's inevitable difficulties. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. But the Christian is not to give up or be morose or be outraged or agitated or any of the things that we tend to do when we see circumstances that we don't like. The joy of the Lord is your strength, not the outrage about the situation. No, no, no. It's the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's very easy to let outrage. Have you ever noticed what outrage does to your soul? If you let outrage live in your soul, then your soul is going to be like a blasted heath after a while. You're literally poisoning your own well. And you won't have strength to keep serving God. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The Christian is to be profoundly joyful, so much so that his joy gives him strength to not be grieved, even when he's d dealing with his own grief. Joy is energy in the soul, and it comes from digesting the right soul food. You have to digest the right soul food, as we've seen. I rejoice in the way of, my, of thy testimonies, as in all riches. Jesus said in John 17, 13, here's another verse that's really great about the word-centered nature of joy. Remember I said you have to eat the right soul food to have joy? Well, here's another verse about that. We already looked at Psalm 119, verse 14, I rejoice in the way of thy testimonies and all riches. Here's a verse that says essentially the same thing. It's basically saying that joy comes from digesting the word of God. So, uh, John 17, 13 says, Jesus is talking to the Father in prayer, and he says, these things I speak, there's the word of God, these things I speak in the world, that they, that is, that his disciples may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Biblical joy is word-centered, and it strengthens you. Do you have strength to face trial after trial after trial, sometimes multiple trials at exactly the same time, and you wonder how many more are going to come, and you just keep going to the Word, and you find somehow it's almost like magic. <laughs> you have joy and, and power, empowerment from the very center and core of your being. Biblical joy makes you strong to do right in hardship. Secondly, God wants our joy, biblical joy, to be consistent joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. It's not supposed to go up and down like a wave of the sea. It's supposed to, you know, he says elsewhere, that, by the way, that statement, rejoice in the Lord always, is in Philippians 4, and then 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18, rejoice evermore. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18. So it's supposed to be consistent. Third, it's supposed to be the norm. So number one, it's supposed to make you strong. 
Number two, it's supposed to be consistent joy. Number three, it's supposed to be the norm. And this is kind of a, a slightly different angle on the second point. But I think it's important because a norm is typical, typically considered in comparison to other things. And in this case, we're talking about joy, which is an emotion. And so when I say it's supposed to be the norm, I'm saying in comparison to other emotions. Is joy the only emotion you're ever supposed to have? If you thought that joy was the only emotion you were ever supposed to have, what sort of person would you be? Well, you'd either be really, really smarmy or a hypocrite. You'd either be really smarmy because every time somebody saw you, you'd be, you know, joyful, and that gets tiresome very quickly. Um, but also, you probably wouldn't even be able to pull it off. So you'd end up being a hypocrite as you tried to plaster a smile all the time. When he says rejoice in the Lord always, he's not saying that that's the only appropriate emotion to have. He is saying it's a norm. It's the normative Christian emotion. It's not the only right one, but to say that it's the norm, it means that it should not often be superseded by other allowable emotions and never by any sinful emotion. There are lots of allowable emotions. For example, here's five. God wants you to abhor evil. He tells us so in Romans 12. So abhor evil. Also, be convicted of sin. Also, weep with those who weep. Also, feel a holy discontent at your own progress in the Christian life. <laughs> Add to your faith virtue. Keep adding. Keep adding. Don't be content with your, your degree of holiness. So, feel a holy discontent. And also, sorrow over the fate of the wicked. Should you not sorrow over the fate of the wicked? Absolutely. And sometimes... Some of those emotions should take precedence momentarily. If you go to a funeral, for example, of an unbeliever, and you really consider what happened to them the moment their eyes closed, closed in death, it would be just abhorrent for you to just tack a smile on your face. There are times when sorrowing over the fate of the wicked ought to take front and center stage in your heart. And when you are to weep with those who weep, that means your sorrow for somebody's suffering should take center stage. But you were told to rejoice in the Lord always. And that means that these other emotions, though sometimes they may need to take the precedence, should never become the norm. Joy is the norm. Rejoice evermore. Rejoice in the Lord always. Jesus himself wept when he beheld Lazarus' death's effect on his family. Jesus himself was grieved at people's hard hearts. Those are emotions that are right in certain circumstances. A terrible illness or loss of a family member will give you grief and make you sorrow. But... Whatever emotion may temporarily need to take center stage, it shouldn't override joy's primary place. It's really crucial to see this and to accept what I'm saying, okay? Because all I'm doing is I'm taking Paul's statement, rejoice in the Lord always, and I'm synthesizing it logically with other concepts in the Bible and basically saying, yes, there are other emotions that are appropriate at times, and sometimes they must take center stage, but joy is supposed to be the norm because it's one of the only things Paul says to do always. He specifically adds the word always to it. And I should say explicitly says it several times in his epistles. And so it's a norm, and it's utterly crucial to accept this. And that makes joy an acid test for you. It really does. There are a lot of people that can get A-pluses on theology quizzes, but th that theology never trickles down to create joy in their hearts. And the question for you today is, do you rejoice in the Lord? Do you find joy when you go to the Scripture? And are you becoming more and more and more of a joyful person? Not just don't worry, be happy. We're not talking about that. We're talking about joy in the Lord. There's a basis to it. In fact, I should go on to some other of my points about joy here. What have we said so far? Biblical joy makes you strong in hardship. 
Biblical joy should be consistent. And thirdly, biblical joy should be the norm in comparison to other emotions. And also, biblical joy is joy in Christ. Notice, rejoice in the Lord always. It's not just happiness in general. Rejoice in the Lord always. And that means at least two things. Let me give you these two points. The phrase, in the Lord, is interpreted differently. I think it's pretty clear. If I said I rejoice in basketball always, what would I mean? If I said, man, I rejoice in basketball always, what am I talking about? I love basketball. (laughs) Exactly. I love basketball. It's so simple when you put it that way. To say rejoice in the Lord always ought to be just intuitive as can be. If you say I love, I rejoice in crocheting always, I'll nod my head and I'll say, well, that's nice for you, you know. Um, if you lo- if you rejoice in the chrome on your vehicle, you're always out there polishing it, you know. If you rejoice in fif- uh, 1950s monster movies, great. Okay, I like a few of those too. Um, it's clear what rejoice in the Lord always means. It means that he's the subject or the matter over which we're rejoicing. Okay. He's what we love. There it is. So simple. So the question then becomes, you know, do you like nature or sports or travel, but you really don't think much about the Christ of the Bible? Rejoice in the Lord always. Is it okay to rejoice in nature and sports or travel? Absolutely. It's absolutely okay. But if you don't care about the Christ revealed in the Bible, then I don't think that you're rejoicing in nature is really related to God. Christians love Christ. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 16, 22. I want to show you something that's one of the most sobering things that I've ever found in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 16, 22. It's wonderful and sobering all at the same time. Please turn with me there. I want you to lay eyes on this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Here in the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, he's, Paul is giving his final instructions in this epistle. He says all, all sorts of things. He says in verse 13, to be watchful and to stand firm. He says in verse 15, I urge you, brothers, that you know the household of Stephanus, and so on. He's saying, connect with people. I rejoice, verse 17, at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus, and so on. Very thankful for people about how they refreshed his spirit, verse 18. And then he says something here that is, I think, kind of shocking, and really, it's like a final stamp on the minds of the Corinthians in this epistle. He wants to leave them with something that is very stark and that is very clear, and it's a clear line drawn on the sand. He says in verse 21, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand, and then he says, if anybody has no love for for the Lord, let him be accursed. You see what he's saying here? He's basically saying that Christians love Christ, and if you don't have any love for Christ then let you be, may you be accursed. Remember that quote that I put on our bulletin several weeks ago, that the worth, of the, the worth of a person's soul is determined by what it loves. If anyone loves not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. What happens when you love the Lord that way? Look over at Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 shows you something I think very amazing about what happens when you get a group of people together who love the Lord. Turn over to Malachi. This is the last book of your Old Testament right before Matthew. He says here, um, he describes people who fear the Lord. And that is an Old Testament phrase that includes love for God. It's a pretty broad phrase in the Old Testament. In chapter chapter 3, verse 16 of Malachi, it says, Those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. What were they talking about when they spoke to one another? Well, they feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They're talking about God with each other. 
Christians love Christ, and they take great delight at biblical thoughts of Him, and then they talk about Him with others. Okay? So what we're talking about here is Christ is the subject in which we find joy. But secondly, this phrase, in the Lord always, also refers to the fact that He provides the basis for experiencing joy. In other words, this is not a baseless catchphrase like, don't worry, be happy. If you ever want to feel sick, type in, don't worry, be happy lyrics, and then read them. Somebody come along and stole your bed, you have no place to lay your head, don't worry, be happy. And it's like that the whole way through. There's absolutely no basis for joy. See, Paul is not pro- promoting baseless catchphrases, baseless joy. He's saying, basically, by saying rejoice in the Lord always, he's basically saying that God has done so many eternal things for you in Christ that it literally is a basis for overturning all negativity as a norm. You see what that's saying? He's saying that God has done so much eternally for you that it justifies your joy flying in the face of any negative thing that comes along, anything that you might interpret as negative. And he says crazy things elsewhere that justify what I'm saying. He says things like this, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to Christ Jesus. I mean, all things work together for good. That means nothing can ultimately hurt you. It basically means that God has promised to exercise His almighty arm, His omnipotence, in order to love you forever and protect you from all harm. So that you can honestly say with Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house. All the days of my life, surely goodness and mercy will follow. And then when I go into the next world, I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See, there's a basis there. And here's the thing. I remember one of the quotes from Charles Bridges that I like is, don't lie against the truth by allowing your face to display gloom, he said. And I I like that statement. Don't lie against the truth by being negative. Have you ever thought of your negative grunt as a lie against the truth? Exactly. That's exactly what it is. We're supposed to be rejoicing in the Lord always, and we have a basis to do so. And to do, to allow gloom is to say, my problems outweigh your salvation. So now what we need to do, we've looked at what biblical joy is. Let me just remind us of the, of the points that I made. It makes you strong to do right in hardship. It's supposed to be consistent It's supposed to be normative or the norm in comparison to other allowable emotions. And then it's also to be focused on Christ. Christ is the matter or the subject. And believe me, um, it's so important for you to repent of your disinclination to study Him and think about Him. Because I know you. I know you're disinclined to do it. I know you'd rather get on YouTube How do I know that? Because you all have Adam's nature. I know that it's hard. And when you face that hardship and you don't want to study the Bible to learn more about Christ or buy, you know, I've got this many books on one shelf that are just like all from the Puritans. And it took actually quite a bit of hardship to get me to want to read them. It takes, sometimes it takes God really just laying into you to change your heart so that you really are seeking the Lord and reading the right things. It's amazing how, how much chastening we really need. But the joy we're supposed to have is joy in Christ. So repent of your disinclination and say, Lord, I'd rather look at YouTube I'm a mess. Lord, I'd rather look at this gaming blog. I'm a mess. Lord, I'd rather read this magazine. I'm a mess. Play this video game. I'm a mess. Save me from myself and my own inclinations. 
Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Because Christians love Christ. And so we have joy in Christ. That's the subject in which we find joy. And also, He's the basis for experiencing joy. Now, this leads us to why joy is so important. Choosing joy asserts that circumstances can't compare with God. That is it in a nutshell. Choosing joy asserts that negative circumstances should never counterbalance or outweigh the greatness of Christ and His salvation. You are constantly balancing things in your mind. It's like you can think of your heart and mind as one of those scales. To give negative circumstances like the ones that we're in right now as American people, to give those circumstances such weight that it literally outweighs Christ's salvation is a lie against the truth, my friend. You've got to straighten that out and give Christ the weight. That's, in fact, I think, a good way to think about what Christian warfare is all about. Christian warfare is about making sure that the kingdom of God is like in your soul. Somebody, I think Cotton Mather said that preaching is supposed to restore the kingdom of God to the soul of man. That's what's supposed to be going on when you have your quiet times, when you listen to this preaching from this pulpit, uh, when you read spiritual books. You're asking God, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Restore a right spirit within me. Put your kingdom within me. Help me to think and feel the way I ought to in light of all that you've done for me. Because I've got this nature that goes astray. Save me. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And so, the importance of this is that it's like a confession of faith. Joy, it's like a theology of joy. Joy is a confession of faith in an important sense. It's not merely intellectual, but emotional. Choosing joy is like inserting a magnifying glass over, the, over Christ and saying, I'm going to look at this and rejoice in this. And then when somebody comes along and says, give me that magnifying glass and let's look at this terrible thing in the world over here, joy says, no way, I got something really important to look at here and I am not going to let you take my gaze off of this because that thing that you're wanting to freak out about is going to be gone and pretty soon I'm going to be gone and in the next life forever. Let's get some perspective and priorities going here. Give me that, fl- give me that uh, magnifying glass and let's look at the right thing again. That's what Joy says. Joy says God's gospel is the big thing, capital B, capital T, the big thing. And God's gospel deserves our attention. And that's true even if the earth falls apart, Psalm 46, 2. Even if the mountains are uprooted and cast into the depths of the sea, still I will rejoice in God my Savior. This is what we should be doing. Do you feel like this is uh, like a big part of what your life is like as a Christian? It better be. You have an enemy who wants you to be downcast. Why are you cast down, O my soul? You have an enemy that wants you to be depressed. You want an enemy that wants you to be agitated. You know why? Because if he can get you depressed and agitated and get your eyes off of Christ, then he knows you're not rejoicing in Christ, and you're supposed to be doing that always. And rejoicing in Christ glorifies Christ in your soul. He knows that if he can rub joy out of your heart and put depression and agitation and, and other things in it, then he has eradicated the kingdom in somebody's heart. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, that's the kingdom of God. Romans chapter 14. If you let it happen, and it does happen, that's what we have to fight all the time. We have to fight. It does happen because it's so easy to get bent out of shape about even the smallest things. Don't let small things eradicate the kingdom of God out of your heart. Joy in the Holy Ghost. So you see how important this is. This is the great fight of faith. It's the great fight of faith. Let's talk about some action points to promote it thirdly, some applications here. I've got seven applications. I'm going to go through these really quickly because we're right at uh, the time right now. But I've got seven applications, action points to promote biblical joy in your life. Number one, 
you do need to deal with this experientially before the Lord. That is, repent of your negativity. Repent of your anger, your depression. And then rejoice that God's redemption deals with all your sin. And that His Spirit empowers you to be joyful. So the very first thing you need to do is repent and believe the gospel. That's the very first thing you need to do. When you recognize that you've allowed things in the world to overwhelm your soul so that you've fallen into that which is not joy, (laughs) okay? When you recognize that, you just repent of your waywardness and you flee back to God in repentance and faith in the gospel, believing that Christ deals with all your sin, including this lack of joy, and that He empowers you through His Spirit to be joyful. I'm doing this all the time. I do it every day, all the, all the time. Constantly doing it. Uh, semper reformanda, life is supposed to be continual repentance. Secondly, diligently study the Bible and biblical doctrine to fuel joy. Diligently study the Bible and biblical doctrine to fuel your joy. Remember, that's the, it's the kindling in the stove that keeps the stove warm. If you notice you're giving more time to a conservative blog or something like Rush Limbaugh, God forbid, um, and you're giving less time to the Word, okay, well, you're putting something in your soul, and it might warm it up, but it's going to crack the metal, okay? It's going to ruin stuff. You need to put the right thing in. The proper soul food creates joy. So number one, repent. Number two, diligently study the Bible and biblical doctrine to fuel joy. Number three, confront yourself, a la Psalm 42. Confront yourself just like Psalm 42 shows us and insist that your emotions respond to truth, not circumstances. Take yourself in hand, as as, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones put it, Defy yourself and say with this man, yet shall I praise God, and so on. So make it a habit of confronting yourself. You have to because your your soul so easily goes astray. Number four, store up truth from the Word to talk about with others. Here's the deal. Um, Are you able to talk uh, about scriptural truth with other people? Are you able to carry on a conversation about God and Christ and salvation in a way that edifies people and they walk away encouraged. Be able to do that. I'm not saying this in a way to try to shame you if you don't feel like you're able to. That's not the point. The point is, is to set up an, a, basically a help. You need, to, you need to think, you know what, I need to be able to be encouraging. And the best thing that's encouraging is, you know, scriptural input and guidance, biblical wisdom. Can you give that? Is it the, is it the thing you like to talk about? Store up, store up truth from the Word to talk about joyfully with others, and then you're not just encouraging yourself to be joyful, but others as well. You become this little nexus of joy. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It's like, it's like you become this little spot in the earth where and anybody else who connects with you get influenced with joy. Have you ever been around somebody who's like exactly the opposite of that? They're like, the moment you walk in the room, you can feel the, just the waves of negativity coming off this person, and everybody that connects with them, it, it's the opposite. We want to not be that way. We want to be a, kind of a, you know, a connectivity person with joy so that people who come into contact with us are blessed. And the way you do that is by storing up the truth of the Word to talk about joyfully with others. Fifthly, it's inevitable that we're going to have to talk about distressing things, right? We can't just always talk about you know, what we learn in our quiet times. We're going to have to talk about distressing things, whether it be the loss of a loved one or a riot or, you know, political things that we're not happy about or something distressing in your life, whatever. We're going to have to talk about distressing things with people. There's a statement in Psalm 73 where the psalmist says, I'm not going to speak about this because I don't want to offend God's people. Read Psalm 73, you'll find that statement. In other words, this fifth point is when you speak of potentially distressing things, be careful. Use encouraging words from a biblical worldview with no complaining. Okay, I love that statement. Encouraging words from a biblical worldview with no negativity, 
with no complaining. When you talk about things that are negatives, you've got to talk about it in the context of a biblical worldview. What is that context? What is the context of the biblical worldview? Romans 8, 28, Psalm 23. In other words, we don't want to talk. I remember this, there's an old saying about uh, Martin Luther. Martin Luther could sometimes not live up to the uh, truth that he knew about. Sometimes he'd get so depressed he'd lock himself in his study and not come out for days. He was cast down. He needed help. One day his wife walked in. She was all dressed in black as though she was going to a funeral. And, um, and Luther looked up from his depression and said, Who died? And Kitty, his wife, said, I guess God did from how you're behaving. Wow, she had a tongue on her, didn't she? Yeah. And, uh, and Luther got the point. He got the point. See, we can lie against the truth by allowing ourselves to display gloom. She, he needed a little help, so she gave it to him in her acerbic sort of way. I heard that they had a very frank relationship, and it would have been interesting to her, hear some of those conversations. And so, when you talk about potentially distressing things, don't talk about it as though God had died. Talk about it from a biblical worldview with encouraging words. Sixth, put to death what is earthly in you. Set your mind on heaven, your true home. I read a great question in Flavel recently. He said, can I bear the loss of earthly comforts with joy? That helps you see if really truth is outweighing circumstances in your heart. Can you bear the loss of earthly comforts with joy? If you want to see whether or not truth outweighs circumstances in your soul, that's a great question. Or does loss make you fearful? Does loss make you angry or agitated? And then seventh and last, last action point or applicational point here. Recognize that hardship weans you from the world. What is God doing by allowing you to lose loved ones? What is God doing by, by you know, setting things up so that there's so much hypocrisy in American politics, and so that you could see how Amer America could lurch not just towards Sodom and Gomorrah, but lurch towards some kind of totalitarianism. Why is God doing this? Hardship weans you from the world and helps you to long for your heavenly kingdom. That's what it does. It's actually God doing you a favor to remind you what really matters most. One of the most important things for us all is to long for heaven, just as Paul did. And so, these are the things I think that we need to keep in mind in our day and our times right now, especially in our times. We need to have biblical joy. We need to know what it is. We need to see why it's important. And then... By God's grace, we need to have it and experience it and practice it and insist on it. Oh, may that be your experience. Oh, may your life be one of spreading joy. When people connect with you, they don't get anger. They don't get agitation. They don't get depression. When people contact you, when people come in into your presence or read your post, or get a phone call from you, or an email. May it be suffused with what God wants it to be, suffused with, dripping with biblical joy.